Hello, my name is Daniel Crook. I'm a software engineer at IBM. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about serverless architectures. So serverless architectures have been, been quite a hot topic in the last year or so because they offer quite a few new technological ways to build cloud-native uh, cloud applications, and they've introduced a very efficient cost model. So these serverless architectures get their name because developers, you know, with the evolution of cloud, are focusing more and more on the actual applications that they're building rather than the infrastructure that's underneath them to support them. So from the developer point of view, they're serverless, but of course there's, there's plenty of infrastructure that sits behind them. And because the developer is focusing more and more on the application code and rather the infrastructure, they provide a, a, the serverless platforms address many of the operational concerns uh, put forth by the 12 factors, the best practices for developing applications. So um, developers can get a lot of those benefits and focus on less of the concerns to build applications well. Uh, another trend that's making them popular is there's a bunch of non-web use cases that want to take advantage of cloud architectures, the scaling models that are in there, so such as um, if there is a change to an object storage service or a database change to provide some logic to handle that event or to handle uh, MQTT messages that come from IoT devices uh, to be able to uh, do some edge analytics with that information. Um, conversational bots uh, providing uh, a way to plug into social platforms, a different deployment model. And tasks that may only run for a few seconds or minutes over the course of a day. You don't want to deploy a whole system, you just want to have a time task that runs once a day, for example. And of course, uh, mobile application backends where uh, developers focus on really the, the user experience of what's in the device rather than worrying about auto scaling all the backend services. And along with those technical benefits to the developer, uh, the cost model is really providing a new way to map the compute time used by the application more closely with how they're charged. So um, while serverless is not a great fit for every single workload, it's not a silver bullet, it provides a way for these event-driven workloads to have a more efficient um, cost model. So those technological trends are coming together and making it uh, very compelling. And I expect this time next year, there's going to be lots and lots more talk about serverless architectures. So how do developers actually get to implement service, serverless architectures? Well, IBM introduced an open source project called OpenWhisk about eight months ago. And this provides a flexible platform for developers to deploy their functions as a service. So it can be run either on a public cloud like Bluemix, uh, on a local on-prem OpenStack cloud, or the upstream developers who are working on the open source project can deploy OpenWhisk on their laptops. It's also been designed to be very flexible. So uh, microservices, you want to be able to deploy them in a polyglot way or write them in a polyglot way. So it supports many different languages and a mechanism to extend that with any arbitrary bi uh, binary through Docker. So a developer working with OpenWhisk, they're focused on four key primitives, right? They're defining their event services, their event sources, I'm sorry, such as uh, GitHub webhooks, IoT data, database changes as triggers. They then write applications uh, in Java, um, Python, JavaScript, or Docker, which provide basically just implement a main signature, which they use to um, respond to those events, and then they can declare the, the mapping many to many either way of those event sources to the actions that process them. And one of the key hallmarks of OpenWhisk versus other systems is that it provides a packaging mechanism so you can get events not only from the cloud that you're on, but also any arbitrary event source, uh, and these packages can be written by third-party developers. There's a bunch already built in there for integration with, with Kafka messages, um, Slack, IBM Watson services, and so on. Uh, the easiest way for a developer to kind of kick the tires with it is to go to bluemix.net. Uh, the value add that we have above the open source project is a web IDE, some wizards to start with your first actions, as well as to trace the monitoring of how your actions are doing, how you debug them, and what the estimated cost uh, might be. Now, there are servers behind the serverless architecture. So open, Whisk as an open source platform. It's built on a lot of well-tested open source projects such as, I'm sorry, Nginx, CouchDB, Console, Kafka. And of course, those actions you write eventually are run on Docker containers 
on a host of uh, nodes behind the scenes. You can uh, learn more by following that link. There's a great article written by the core developer on uh, how OpenWhisk works under the hood. And so we invite you to uh, either try out as a developer on bluenix.net, or if you're interested in joining the open source community we're building around OpenWhisk, uh, go to the GitHub repos at openwhisk.org, uh, or talk to the developers directly on our public Slack channel. And you can also find other IBM open source, such as Amalgamate, a framework for uh, deploying microservices on top of clouds, such as Kubernetes, at developerworks.open. Thank you very much.